SEP Fanfic Readings presents The Water Gaw by Smoky Baltic and Ectoheart. Chapter 6 Hermione woke up still very much entangled with Draco. She had turned toward him slightly in the course of the night, so his forehead was now resting against her cheek, and she couldn't even begin to account for where everyone's hands were. She also didn't really care to account for the fact that it was wonderful. Even in sleep his hold was firm, pulling her into his reassuring warmth where she fit perfectly, snuggled against his chest, her hips cradled by his. He felt safe and strong, and all manner of things he had no business being. His nose nudged her jaw as he stirred, and she held as still as she possibly could, hardly daring to breathe. She wanted desperately to delay properly waking up, an occasion which would necessitate her leaving her delicious little cocoon, and facing not only the day, but the cocoon himself. She grit her teeth as Draco gave a little groan and nuzzled against her neck. Fuck. Fuck if this wasn't downright blissful. Therapy. This will require scads and scads of therapy, she thought, even as she sank a little further into his arms. Eventually, of course, they did need to get up. As soon as Draco groggily began to rouse, Hermione was off like a shot, making herself busy with fixing her hair, conjuring water to drink, and tidying up. She was a touch starved, was all, and it had been very cold, and this was a frightening situation, and they just happened to be complimentary heights, and she'd been mostly unconscious, and it was cold, and she was repeating herself, but it's not like she needed to make excuses. Lost time, duress, extraordinary circumstances, no need to panic. By mid-morning, they had caught sight of a forest sprawling around the base and up the side of which appeared to be a long, high ridge, which was fortunate because the weather did not seem to be on their side. The temperature had risen dramatically, but with the warmth came gusting winds that rolled over the moors, carrying heavy thunderhead clouds on their backs. The low rumble of thunder could already be heard as the sky began to darken. They hurried on, running on the downhills, hustling to make it to cover in time. For all the tension of worrying they wouldn't make it in time, to avoid being caught in the downpour, Hermione couldn't deny the exhilaration she felt. The swell of the storm wasn't unlike the surge she felt when preparing to cast a spell. Energy was gathering, preparing to be unleashed. There was a flash of lightning, and fat drops of rain began to fall. They were only a hundred meters off from the tree line now, and Hermione let loose a peal of laughter, giddy with the shrill of feeling the thunder right in her bones as they sprinted the final stretch. They were both panting when they drew up under the cover of the trees. "'It's going to be a wild one,' Draco's eyes were flashing. A curtain of nearly torrential rain could be seen sweeping down toward them, and though it could hardly be noon, it was as dark as twilight. "'Build a fire,' Hermione asked. "'We can wait it out?' They took their time gathering wood, finding a spot where there was a large rock to sit against, which would block the wind, and which provided a view of the storm raging over the moor. "'Tell me a story, Granger,' Draco entreated as he sat aside the now empty tin of lentil stew, leaning back against the rock beside her with his hands behind his head, eyes half-lidded. "'Nap time, is it? I'm not your mum. "'Come on,' he stretched out a foot and prod her leg. "'How about the tales of Beetle the Bard? Would that suit Ickle Baby Malfoy's tastes?' She needled good-naturedly, as she crawled forward to pull a tin out of the fire. Pine-needle tea again.' He ignored her teasing. Just fine. Go on, then. Hermione settled back against the rock a few feet from him and took a cautious sip of tea. She cast a sidelong look at Draco before she began to recite the tale of the three brothers. She knew it by heart by now. The truth was that it had been preying on her mind again the last couple days. The hallows and the horcruxes. She had no new information. She couldn't pursue any leads or follow up any theories, and she set it aside for a while. But there was Draco. Draco and his unknown stores of knowledge. More than once she had been tempted to discuss it with him. Not only was he intelligent, with a broader knowledge of the wizarding world than she had, but he might have insight into Voldemort and his plans. Even the opportunity to talk through the problem with someone new would be helpful. Ron hadn't had much to contribute on either topic, and Harry's ideas were mostly born of instinct or emotion. She longed to discuss it with someone who thought more like she did, that might help her puzzle it out. Of course, she couldn't tell him. She knew that. Even bringing up the tale of the three brothers was taking a probably unnecessary risk. But as she watched him for any particular reaction, 
she found nothing to signify. When she'd finished the story, his eyes were closed, although she could tell he wasn't sleeping. "'You know, when we get out of here, there's something I'm working on,' she ventured. "'Even if I can't find Harry and Ron, there's this thing I need to keep working on.' His brow furrowed a little, but that was the only sign he'd heard. "'You could help me, if you wanted.' She peeked out of the side of her eye and found he was looking at her. One eye just cracked open. "'Think about it,' she urged. Even as she made the offer, she wasn't sure whether she would ever tell him anything, but she wanted to know his answer. He said he didn't have a side. Would he take one, if it was offered? He made it sound like he hadn't had any choice in his life, but perhaps he just didn't know how to make them. Minutes later, thunder cracked almost directly overhead, and Hermione jumped, startled from her reverie, sloshing tea over her jumper. The rain itself was a dull roar on the canopy overhead, although hardly any penetrated through to the forest floor. They were right in the thick of the storm now. "'Do you want to?' Draco looked pointedly at the ground beside him as the world was momentarily lit with a blinding flash of lightning. Hermione pursed her lips, because this was all getting a little too familiar, wasn't it? But she shifted over until their shoulders were touching. After a moment, Draco lifted his arm, and she willfully ignored the internal cacophony of protest from all her instincts towards prudence and pride to lean into him, resting her head against his chest as his arm curled around her shoulders. "'Tell me a story, Malfoy,' she cajoled. "'I'm not a trained crup. I don't perform on command.' "'Hey!' she poked him hard in the ribs. "'Fine, fine,' he chuckled. "'But you're very needy, you know.' Then he launched into a story about Quidditch. When that was drowned out by her protests, he began another story that meandered through a woebegone childhood before it became clear the climax of the tale would be Quidditch stardom and she had to take measures to physically silence him. Eventually, they settled on discussing the appropriate regulatory approach to potion-making, and Hermione confirmed Draco's entirely predictable libertarian bent. It was still an interesting and nuanced conversation, though and he had her on her heels, having to make excuses for some of Fred and George's shop offerings. And if she couldn't help flinching when there was a particularly loud roll of thunder, Draco probably couldn't help the way he briefly pulled her in a little closer each time. It was several hours before the heavy rain eased, and there was only a distant echo of the storm as it moved off northward. Look, she nudged him, tilted her chin toward a spot just over the far ridge. A rainbow. Sort of. He squinted at the spot, just where there was a fragment of a rainbow. Just a smudge, really. Not much after all the rain we've had. I think it's called a watergar, when it's just a patch. Well, credit to whoever came up with a name like that. They're not overselling it. She hummed. Anyway, I think it's probably our cue to get moving. She pushed herself up to stand, stretching out limbs that were stiff with spending so long in one position. As she reached her hands up over her head and turned, she found Draco still sitting, looking up at her. She gave his foot a little kick. Come on. He tossed a stick at the fire, which had burned low. It's pretty late, and we're already set up here. You want to stay? We wouldn't get far anyway, and I don't want to get stuck out in the open again. Everything will be wet. I guess, she frowned. It's probably, what, four o'clock? Five? Time to stop for tea. But of course we don't have any proper tea, so it'll have to be wine. Hermione rolled her eyes. Pathetic attempt. He only smiled, as if he knew he'd be getting his way in the end. While she didn't give in on the wine, she did concede to staying put for the rest of the day. It really was a nice little spot, and the lazy afternoon was primed for slipping into a lazy evening. Besides, they'd been walking for, God, ten days. Up to this point, Hermione had noted the passing of time with an anxiety that drove her forward, but just now it hit with a wave of almost oppressive weariness. They'd been going on and on and on, and maybe it was time for a break. Once you've stepped off the ledge, you might as well enjoy the feel of the wind on your face, he'd said. The words had been hovering at the edge of her consciousness ever since. Bleak at first blush, but they rang true. On some level they resonated. After all, wasn't that just what she'd been doing since she realized at twelve years old that she'd stick by Harry Potter no matter what? Hadn't she always known, deep down, 
Some version of being tortured, lost, and alone lay along that path. Maybe, probably, death. She wished she had a damn book. There was too much space for thinking out here. In lieu of reading, she had to settle for bickering and goofing off, and at the end of the night, spooning with her enemy come accomplice. Good decision, Hermione affirmed as she blinked awake to blue skies. She was warm, not only from being snuggly tucked in against the heat of Draco's body, but from the morning sun that was already shining with a vigor that Scotland hadn't seen in months and months. A patch of intrepid violets was blooming just an arm's length away. Her head felt clearer. Her long, suffering legs and back felt close to what she thought she remembered normal was. The usual pit of dread in her gut felt comparatively shallow this morning. It was well past sunrise, but Draco was clearly still asleep, because they didn't seem to have moved an inch since last night. Maybe he'd suffocated in her curls. Except, no. She became aware of his hand spread over her hip and the broad thumb that was drifting beneath her jumper, where it was tracing lazy circles against the bare skin over her hip bone. It was just at the edge of tickling, causing a tingling sort of sensation she found was very pleasant. A sensation that was, in fact, going straight to her. Oh, fuck no. She gave a little start at the realization of exactly what was going on, and he stilled instantly. There was a painfully long standoff as they both went rigidly still, before Draco finally cleared his throat and rolled away. "'Good morning.' His voice was rough with sleep. "'Mm-hmm.' Hermione buried her face in her hands to clear away the sleep and sort herself out. Obviously, she'd been pseudo-dreaming and needed some time for her rational brain to become operative. She shook herself out for a minute and stretched languidly, pushing herself up to sit cross-legged. Draco had dropped the last bit of kindling on the embers still smoldering from the night before— and directed a lazy incendio at it. She was getting quite proficient at performing the charm wandlessly now. They made tea from pine needles and some leaves from a large minty plant that she wasn't sure of the name of, and ate a few dried dates. The plan they'd settled on was to carry on through the trees, and a little ways up the peak so they could get a bit of height to see the best southward route. It might have been the weather, or it might have simply been progress of the season— but the woods were alive with the sounds of bird calls and the furtive little noises of animals skittering about on their spring business. There was vibrancy to the forest that was probably attributable to yesterday's rain. It all made for a very tranquil morning walk. Which was probably why, despite the fact that she was currently wandering the wilderness in the middle of a nearly year-long succession of relentless catastrophes and misfortunes, that it still managed to catch her off guard when their plans were unceremoniously overthrown, and probably two days' worth of progress went out the window. Where they were expected to meet the beginning of the rise of the peak, they instead stumbled onto the edge of an enormous lock. The trees had unexpectedly given away to a bit of rock, a thin band of sand, and then the impassable water which skirted the peak. The lock wasn't wide, probably only fifty meters across, but Hermione couldn't see how far it spanned east to west. In any event, there was certainly no way to continue south. Hermione cursed prolifically, snarled some choice words at Ron, and threw a few rocks at the water for good measure. Could not one bloody thing go to plan? Was she not allowed to have a strategy even of any kind? Old tantrum doubt? Draco smirked. Hermione turned on him, flinging her arms out pathetically. Why can't I have nice things? She whined. Go south is literally the loosest, shittiest semblance of a plan I've ever had, and we can't even do that. Maybe the universe is trying to force some zen on you, he speculated unhelpfully. Release your expectations. Well, then the universe has got some shitty fucking timing. She kicked viciously at the sand and turned back to glare again at the personal affront masquerading as a lock. You're telling me. She heard him mutter darkly behind her. Hermione rolled her neck and shook her arms out. All right, she sighed. All right. Accepting her defeat with a bad grace, she stalked back toward Draco. Well, shall we cast stones or read tea leaves or something to decide which way to go? Might as well. Seems likely to work as anything else. "'So you're definitely not on course for becoming horribly bitter at all.' Her eyes narrowed menacingly. "'Whatever happened to your instinct towards self-preservation?' "'Fuck if I know.' He shook his head mournfully. She wasn't even sure if he was joking, or in earnest. And maybe it was the fact that she couldn't tell that would bank her anger. 
Okay, I'm fine. I'm over it. This will be fine. Add a girl. So, she looked east, then west. Draco made a gentlemanly gesture for her to proceed ahead of him, to the west. If he had any knowledge or instinct about which direction was most expedient, Hermione was beginning to suspect he'd chosen the worse option. As soon as he seemed confident she wasn't going to bite his head off, he began pestering her about stopping. The lock, he argued, was a blessing in disguise, a brilliant stroke of luck. "'I think this is it,' Draco said, surveying the almost cloudless sky, his jacket folded over his arm. "'I think it has to be today.' Hermione shuddered, dancing a little with nerves. "'I don't know. I don't know. We need this, and it could be a while before conditions are this good again. Besides, I don't feel like doing much more walking today.' She bit her lip, still unsure. It would have to be, like, now. It's got to be at least noon already, and we should build a fire first. A huge fire, he agreed, smiling now. We'll keep it going all night. Oh, God, Hermione whined. Okay. She was dreading this, but some small part of her, probably the part that had got her sorted into Gryffindor, thrilled at the challenge. And she certainly wasn't prepared to wuss out before prima donna Malfoy. A little over an hour later, Hermione was clutching at the blanket wrapped around her shoulders, the only thing preserving her modesty and any remnants of warmth. The sand and rocks were cold but smooth against her bare soles as she shifted from one foot to foot. She puffed her cheeks out, taking a last few deep breaths to summon up her courage as Draco tossed a final branch on the great bonfire they had blazing away on the beach. It was sending up sparks and licking at the sky with flames nearly ten feet high. All of their clothes, except the grey bra and knickers she had on, and the boxer briefs Draco sported, were arrayed beside the fire. "'Ready?' he called. Adrenaline was already flooding her veins as she looked over him and nodded, a wide smile dimpling her cheeks. "'Ready!' Her eyes were bright, and she could actually see him vibrating with anticipation, his smile just as wide as her own. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Go! he hollered, throwing off his own blanket, dashing toward the lock. Hermione dropped her blanket and took off sprinting, the laughter bubbling past her lips, turning to shrieks as she charged into the icy waters that were now slowly lapping over the reddish rocks. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! The frigid water slowed her progress as she caught at her knees, then her hips, then her ribs. It stole her breath away. Draco was yelling and splashing only a few meters off, plunging in to create a dramatic wave with a sidelong dive, immersing himself completely. Not to be outdone, Hermione filled her lungs and hit the bypass switch on all her poor nerve endings, crying out against the cold, submerging herself. Her curls haloed around her as her feet left the lake floor. She was stretched, suspended in a euphoric agony. Her heart was racing and her extremities were burning, but she felt bold and fearless and clean. Her head broke the surface, and she raked her hair out of her face to find Draco looking at her with his eyes wide, mouth agape, and arms held high. "'Holy shit!' he crowed, before turning back toward the shore. In a deluge of screams and curses and gales of laughter, they waded back to the shore, hair plastered to their heads and their underthings clinging to goose-pimpled flesh. It was a mad scramble for blankets and shoes that were piled up with shaking hands. Hermione kept her blanket tight about her as she peeled away her sodden knickers and bra before tugging on her fire-warmed tracksuit bottoms, shirt, her jumper, then Harry's jumper. Through the flame she could see Draco making similarly awkward maneuvers beneath his blanket as he redressed. She caught a glimpse of his bare torso as he did, and was struck by the long, silvery gouges that bisected his lean, pale flesh. Were those? The tins of tomato soup and pine needle tea— they had left heating were collected and consumed with relish. They sat in the sand, hunched under their thin blankets, chilled but exhilarated, and cozy in a way that could only follow being profoundly cold. High on adrenaline and the acute relief of finally being clean, it was the best that they had felt in weeks, maybe months. They laughed over memories of professors and colorful students, even doing impressions. Hermione had McGonagall dead to rights and managed a very respectable peeves, but her Hagrid was lost on her present audience. Draco, to her delight, 
was uniquely terrible at every one, but was so convinced of his own comedic brilliance that he undertook them all with zeal. He had Hermione laughing helplessly at the farce, tears streaming down her face, which of course he took as proof positive of his genius. The only one he nailed, bizarrely, was Trelawney. Eyes agog, he tittered and trembled and gesticulated wildly, crying out predictions of swarms of doxies, a pestilence that would befall the flubber worms, and the coming of three days of dim lighting. They dragged evergreen boughs from the nearby trees to build up a windbreak between them and the fire, the good humor allowing them to find more humor than frustration in the way it kept tipping over in the sand. Plans were made for the following day. A new strategy, they agreed, was in order. Instead of trying to maximize the distance they traveled or set themselves on a compass heading, they would seek out the best probable vantage point. It would be a slow and grueling climb, but surely from the height of one of the nearby peaks they'd be able to see something that could guide them. Draco made an impassioned argument for finally partaking in the wine, but, although Hermione found herself tempted, his persistence had turned the request into a battle of wills that she was unprepared to lose. When the adrenaline began to ebb, and the mood had mellowed, Draco caught her eye and then glanced at her stomach. "'You've got scars,' he ventured. "'So do you,' Hermione looked pointedly at his chest. "'Are they from—' "'Potter, yeah.' "'Mine's from the Department of Mysteries. Your father and his friends.' Draco nodded at the ground before looking up at her through his fringe. "'Shall we call it even?' Neither of us actually did anything, so, yeah, I think we're good on that one. Good. He made a motion like he was crossing it off his list. When it grew dark, they laid back in the sand, settling comfortably under their blankets, enjoying the heat of the fire and the magnificent view of the stars. There's you, Hermione pointed up at the Draco constellation. And you, pointing a ways left of Draco, Virgo, the celestial virgin. She threw him a cautious look. "'How do you know that?' He shrugged, not looking at her. "'Had a hunch.' They were quiet for a minute before he offered. "'Me too.' "'What?' "'Same.' He tilted his chin a little, indicating Virgo. "'No, you aren't.' "'Yeah, I am.' "'No,' she shook her head, bemused. "'You're not!' "'Granger, I think I'd know.' "'Malfoy, your birthday is in June!' My birthday? What's that got? Oh. Oh. Wait, did you mean? She felt her cheeks flood with heat. My birthday is in September. Virgo is my horoscope. She snuck a peek at him. He was staring at the sky. His eyes were very, very wide. So you're not? His voice was strangled. Um, no, not so much. He cleared his throat. Potter? Wow, that's that's literally none of your business. Please tell me not the weasel, at least. Hermione laughed outright. Crumb? He tried. Malfoy! I think I'd remember if it were me. She couldn't help huffing a laugh, but still smacked his arm. All right, all right, that's enough of that. They went back to silently surveying the sky, but a couple minutes later she heard him mutter, Crumb, like he'd decided. She bared her teeth with an awkward consciousness, but let it go. He wasn't wrong, anyway. Eventually, Draco got up to soak the fire. Hermione watched him with a new sort of interest. She felt a bit bad he'd accidentally divulged something as personal as his virginity, but it certainly gave her something to think about. It shouldn't be surprising, really. She'd never noticed him spending time with any girl in particular, unless you counted Pansy Parkinson, who was a pug-faced and dumber than a troll. She hardly seemed his type. Her eyes followed him down as he crouched by the fire, his brow furrowed with concentration as he laid on new wood. He was a bit too thin, and it emphasized the harsher angles of his face, but he'd grown tall and broad shoulders, and his coloring was obviously striking. Whatever his faults, Draco was undeniably attractive. She was sure he'd had his chances. But then, he, like she and her friends, had been caught up with rather more pressing matters the last few years. When he returned, lowering himself so he could slip under the covers beside her, and leaning back to fold his hands behind his head, Hermione had to admit that he was not simply attractive. He was sexy. 
In her experience, guys her age might, at best, be fit. They might be hot. They might be attractive. But Draco Malfoy, and the way he looked and the way he moved, with his strong and clever fingers and his ridiculously silver eyes, were irrefutably, disconcertingly sexy. Maybe she had a thing for bad boys. How embarrassing! She shook herself. There was a bloody dark lord on the loose. She couldn't be distracted by lusting after one of his sodding minions. Not that she was attracted to him, she hurried to amend. It was simply an objective observation. Academic sexiness. It was a travesty that he could look the way he looked and be so intelligent and also be so... Malfoy. Oh, you okay? His voice seemed gratuitously deep and raspy. Fine. What? Fine, she stammered defensively. Nothing. So it's warm enough? Yep. Yeah, it's good. Fine. I'm tired. Are you tired? Eh. Wish the bloody midges would take a break already. Right? She gave an absurd giggle and then, mortified, turned away from him to lay on her side. Good night, he said uncertainly. Hermione buried her face in her hands and willed the sweet oblivion of sleep to take over. For once she really needed her brain to just stop. She was still awake, though, nearly an hour later, when Draco wrapped her in his arms and pressed his face into her curls. Good night. She heard him mumble again. This was no good. This was no fucking good. <laughs>